Hello everyone, welcome. Um, so, as you can see that this is our norm, not our normal workshop environment, but since we're all moving online now, I'm recording from home, so a little bit more laid back feel here, but um, <coughs> we're going to we're gonna be trying to get the rest, uh, rest of our, our workshops uploaded and recorded. So this is starting with GANs. We also have reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning coming up next. Um, I'm unsure if John will be able to record for the, our Coco Sci lecture, uh, which will be the last one that he'll give. Um, but that's kind of up in the air, but I'm hoping to at least get our, uh, this one in reinforcement learning up. Um, I hope you all are doing well and are safe during this pandemic, keeping your hands washed and such. Um, I might be switching back here just to make sure everything's working good here. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll get this, we'll get this up as soon as possible. You know, thank you for your patience as well with trying to get us all the transition online and stuff. As you're aware, not not many of us were prepared to make this shift, but trying to make this as smooth as possible. So, all right, um, I'm gonna have my pull up my notes here on the side, and let's get started. So, what I plan to do is is that the questions that I would normally ask, I'll probably just um, have I'll pause for like five or ten seconds. You can pause the video and think about it. And then, um, and then you know, resume the video once you have an answer for the question, and then I'll I got, I'll go over the answers. Um, so take a minute or two and think about this uh, question. So how can we learn from data from one type and apply it to another? So a big part of this is like um, if we learn from one domain, so like type of data we call domains. So we have a domain of horses. So just pictures of horses. How can we learn some stuff about horses and apply it to zebras? Well, what does that even mean to apply it? So take a few minutes and think about that. All right. Um, so with uh, you probably one of your guesses might have been what we're learning today, which is GANs, which is part of it. Um, but actually being able to extrapolate data from one domain or another is a, is a huge field in, um, you know, in AI. So we're going to learn uh, a, few, uh, a way to do that and also a lot of other um, generative, keyword generative today, um, generative models. So who here has heard, if you heard about DeepFake, um, taking, you might want to take a second to Google search it if you haven't heard about it. Um, but pretty much it was this whole controversy when, when um, that this network that somebody's able to make was able to very realistically uh, create representations and like videos footage of other um, of other people talking but it was really just you so you could pretty much pretend to be anyone else to a very high degree of accuracy and there was there's a few things that you can like look out for in the, in these like fake videos in order to like see that they're fake but to the normal like untrained eye it would be really hard to tell it's different and this caused a huge like controversy because now like you know you can send out videos that look like they're from like politicians or other people in power and stuff like that when they're really not and it can you know hold all fake news and all that so that sparked a lot of controversy and also audio as well so not only being able to fake you know voice or like you know images and video but also audio like how the person speaks but you know not everything has to be controversial or used for uh evil purposes the GANs themselves are actually really am amazing model architecture um and we're going to learn a little bit we're going to learn a little bit about the base base GAN and some different types and what we can do with them today all right, so I kind of went over a little bit of what, uh, kind of like what GANs can do, but take a second and think about, you know, what that really means. All right, um, so a keyword is generative in the model, so right there, so I also, you know, hinted at that as well. So these GANs, um, GANs excel at generating new data from based on whatever training data 
or based on a domain, I should say. So domain meaning like whatever type of data it is. Um, this isn't introducing any new layers or anything like that. This is using all the stuff we've learned previously. So this isn't no like new, like there's no GAN layer or anything. This is just building our model in such a way where we can actually, where the model is, um, learns to generate data instead of just like predicting or classifying or, you know, things we've used them before. So what are some um, applications? So some, some great ones is that, um, as you know, that training, training uh, neural network models takes a lot of data. And so if you have a small data set, usually you can, you know, you'll overfit really highly or, you know, your model won't even be able to train, doesn't have enough information. So being able to use a GAN to actually generate new data for a small data set can help a lot. Um, you can also just create pretty much anything like art. You, there's scans there's like that create art, music, memes, you know, things like that. Um, so earlier and during our neural network workshop, we actually played a video that of um, of like real music and generated music, and as you see, we can tell the difference. So, you know, that was made using a GAN. Um, so those are pretty interesting. Um, there's also talking about mapping from one domain to another. So not only can we generate new data, but we can take existing data and being able to like modify or change it to do what we want. So we can basically take videos or pictures of like horses and then convert them into, make them look like zebras. And that's called a cycle GAN. Um, so, and, and if you have these slides up, there's a hyperlink there so you can learn more about it. Uh, there's also some other different types that we'll cover today. Uh, DC GAN, which is deep convolutional GAN, so that uses convolutional layers, conditional GAN, and info GAN. Um, so, and we'll talk more about these at, towards the end of the slides. All right. So, before we jump into um, in the GANs, we're going to take a step back here and talk about autoencoders because these uh, autoencoders are a really good um, introduction into. Um, how a GAN can work, uh, how a GAN works. So, um, so let's take a look at this uh, this diagram here. So, our goal for an autoencoder is to learn an encoded representation representation of data, and the purpose of this is to reduce dim dimensionality. So, a lot of big words there. Simply, we're compressing data into a smaller um, uh, size in order to to um, remove like unnecessary information and stuff like that, but also a condensed form of the of, of all the most relevant information. So at the end of it, uh, we'll be able to easily train models because instead of having to train on like huge amount of inputs, it can be a lot, you know, a very small amount of inputs, but still ha contain all the features that it needs to actually learn and perform well. Um, so here, the, there's two parts of the um, autoencoder, the encoder which compresses the data down, and a decoder, which takes the data and decompresses it to back to the original form. So ideally, our input is exactly the same as the output. Of course, it's not always exactly the same in the real world, but that's what we're looking for. Um, so the way this works is, is, that the, um, is that the encoder and the decoder work together to learn this representation of the model. So when the encoder encodes here um, and reaches its bottleneck uh, and the decoder tries to decode that, if it can't like get a good output, so if our output is not anything like our input, then um, when we calculate our loss, it's going to flow back through the de decoder into the, um, into the uh, encoder here. And so what that does is, is that the encoder is like, hey, you didn't encode this right. You need to do x, y, and z. And that's in form of the weight updates. So update the weights here based on like what the decoder found. And then once this happens, um, you know, all the weights are updated, then it'll, the next iteration or encoder should hopefully have a, a slightly better um, uh, bottleneck features that, that encodes for the image. And so a big part of this is um, we have two kind of like two separate networks working together, and that's really important for um, when we're talking about GANs. To keep that in mind. So the labels for this um, for this is just the input itself. So our input and the out and our labels are just the same thing. That we're trying to get it to successfully decode the um, output as close as possible to the original input. Um, 
So another, uh, another important thing to remember is that in here is that once we actually train the encoder to get a very, a very good representation of the input data and these bottleneck features, we can just scrap the decoder. We don't care about the decoder anymore because we're, all we're going to do is we're going to encode our data once we get to these features and we just take these features and pass it into whatever model uh, that's going to use to train on those features. So we don't care about decoding it anymore. So the decoder's purpose, all its purpose is just to train the encoder to work as best as possible. And then after that, we just, just scrap it. It's not needed anymore. Um, so really, I want to talk about like, what is, like, what's the point of doing all this? So I, know, I mentioned one point was that we can use these to help train models better. But what are some other like really good um, applications that we can use for auto encoders and take maybe take a minute to think about that. So some so again the main application is for model input, but it's also really good for when using these compressed features to actually be able to um, compress uh, outputs as well. So not only with inputs, um, so if we, so say if we're generating, depending on whatever model or whatever you're doing, you know, these, you can basically compress, uh, encode anything and, you know, into these, however many bottleneck features that you want. So if you're actually trying to look on, uh, like training on videos and stuff, and there's a lot of frames and things like that, and you're also outputting video, like your model's generating some type of video or something, you can also generate encoded representations of videos. So your model both takes an, in, an encoded, takes an input of an encoded representation and outputs an encoded representation. So the model overall, overall is a lot smaller than just working with the raw video. And then in this case, you would actually want to save the decoder. And so then your decoder can work at the end and actually decode the, um, the output. So that's like another way. Um, without having to throw out the decoder in that case. So it's a lot of interesting stuff you can do with this. Um, so the main takeaways from this is how the coder helps the encoder work, learn and you know vice versa. And then also how the networks learn from each other. How in, in this case that the, that the loss starts here, goes through the decoder and back to the encoder and how the encoder is able to learn from the decoders like you know, loss and things like that. That's really important. All right. So without further ado, let's jump into how GANs work. Oh, one second. All right. So, so this how our autoencoder had an encoder and decoder, our GAN is going to have two separate networks. So that's going to be the generator and the discriminator. So the generator just has in its name, generates the new data. So that's, uh, that's what's going to be actually creating our new data here. The discriminator's job is to determine if this generated data is fake or real. And so what that means is, is like if, if the generator passes a fake image to the discriminator, the discriminator's job is to be like, hey, that's fake, like, and I recognize it. Um, so, so with this, I want to ask this question, what does equilibrium mean with regards to game theory? Because this is a very important concept uh, on understanding how games work. So take a minute and think about this. Okay, so if... Um, if you didn't know, um, so this is called a Nash equilibrium. Um, and with the game theory, is it, the definition is that when every player in the game knows the strategies of the other players. And so if any of the players, there's no point to any of the players changing their strategy because it won't give them any more advantage. Basically, all the players in the game have reached a point where they're performing maximally. They can't, no, no changes to their, how, they cha how they play the game will make them, give them an advantage over the other players. Um, and this is important uh, because 
the generator is working towards fooling the discriminator, so making data that's that's so like the real input data that the discriminator can't tell it's fake anymore. And the discriminator is working to do the opposite. It's working to always be able to classify the fake images correctly. So desired result, it's the discriminator and the generator reach this equilibrium. So what does this equilibrium will actually look like? So we talked about like power looks in game theory, but how would it look like with um, with uh, these two models here? Like the output of each network or maybe the loss, like how would that look? So how that would look um, is um, the generator the discriminator w output, um, so the discriminator is going to be determining whether images are fake or real, right? So if once we reach equilibrium, the discriminator will pretty much be random, randomly guessing at that point. Because at once we reach equilibrium, the generator is working so well that the discriminator pretty much can't tell the difference between the real and fake images. So it just starts randomly guessing. So that'd be like a 50% chance to get it right or wrong. Um, the generator in equilibrium will hopefully be generating data that is, you know, very good generated data that looks quite like the um, our, our training data that we're trying to generate. Um, so that's how that equilibrium works. We'll dive more in depth later in these slides. All right. So with uh, let's take a look at the different parts in uh, the generator discriminator and how these work together. So this is the overall view of the model. Um, so we have our training set, so in this case we just have images of like numbers, so MNIST uh, is our example. Our generator is going to take some random noise, so this random noise is basically, think about it like a seed, like maybe in like, um, you know, for a random number generator, or like a seed in Mine for the Minecraft world, uh, if you play Minecraft, you know, things like that. This, it's pretty much some starting point to, uh, that the generator uses in order to generate the fake image based on this seed. So this random noise goes in, it upsamples. So this is upsampling right here, is what's going on. And getting, because um, cause you know that when we do a convolution, we start with some shallow feature maps. Um, and then as we go through the network, our feature maps get very small, but also get very deep. And then with the generator, it's going to work in the opposite. It's going to start with some deep feature maps, and then it's going to um, upsample them to this, the original input size of the image and however many channels it has. So in our workshop, you know, this, this would just be one channel since they're black and white, but in our workshop we'll work with RGB images. So that'll be pretty, it'll be a lot more interesting there. Um, our discriminator, so once we have a generator image, uh, we feed our training set and our fake images to the discriminator. And the discriminator's job is basically just, you know, it'll downsample this data and stuff and you know, perform whatever layers it has. So in this case, will be convolution since we're working with image data. Um, it's going to determine as real or fake. So hopefully, the training data is determined as real, and our fake images are determined as fake. And that's what the discriminator is trying to do. So let's break down each of these networks and see how they work. So first, we'll start with the discriminator. This is pretty standard stuff we've seen before. This a convolutional neural, in this case this will be a convolutional neural network, or it could just be, you know, there's regular linear layers or an RNN, the stuff we've seen before that works at downsample data, extract features, and produce some output. So in this case our output would just be one node here, so. And these, this is just like an arbitrary 256 by 256 by 3 input image. So this is just like, this is an example. Um, so again, we're taking this root piece from the data, taking the fake data, determine you know which one is real and fake. Um, basic GANs, our output is just one node. Um, so it labels, it doesn't really matter what labels there are. This is like binary labels, zero or one. But it doesn't really matter if zero is fake or one is fake or like one is real and zero is fake. Um, you know, it um, it really doesn't matter. But it actually does. So when I and you'll see why at the end why I say it doesn't, but it actually does. So, but yes, but actually no, right? <laughs> but um, but for sort of zero, um, uh, normally we would just use zero for fake because this makes a little bit more sense. Like zero for fake, one for real. Um, so in that case, then our output closer to zero is mean that the generator or the discriminator determined that this data is fake, and vice versa. Um, so in doing so, 
in doing so, um, determining um, if it, you know, if discriminator is doing really well in determining basically, you know, all the data, th all the generated data is fake. That works really well for the generator because it has a lot to learn. It's like, okay, well, I'm not doing a good job, so um, it's going to learn from the discriminator how to how to better fool it, and then in doing so, it will start generating better data or data that's closer to the training data that we're trying to generate. All right. Um, so the main thing is to take away from this is that determining if a data is real or fake. So our generator. So our generator, um, so this is going to work a bit differently. Um, as you can see here, we're going to be upsampling data. Um, so we start with some, some random noise. So in this case, this is like a 2D matrix, basically, of random noise. Um, this can also just be like a really small size matrix, but have a lot of channels here. So in this case, one channel. It honestly doesn't matter because, again, it's just some random noise to start out with. Um, and then we're going to start at some small feature maps, and then we're going to uh, upsample these each time and also get shallower. So as you can see here, the amount of feature maps get shallower each time until here we're going to be working with RGB images. So our output channels are going to be three for RG and B. And then our output size, our original input size, which is 256 by 256. Um, so there's some different ways in actual code to do this upsampling. Um, so, and we'll get into that more into the workshop. Um, but some main things that we can do here for upsampling is one second. Is gonna there's um, you can just kind of like multiply like the this the uh, the length and width to actually just expand it kind of like just an arbitrary like kind of like extrapolation just make it bigger. Um, there's also in PyTorch which we're going to be using there's uh, what's called a convolutional transpose layer, which basically does the opposite of transpose and it's able to uh, or not the opposite of transpose the opposite of convolution so instead of extracting features and going down it's actually going to expand features and increase the size um, which we'll see in code and they're pretty interesting um, whoops okay right, so a random noise uh, doesn't always have to be random noise so uh, the random values if we're doing random noise can be between 0 and 1 or negative 1 and 1 but um, but we can also just input other images. So when I talked about CycleGAN, you know, our input to the generator won't be a random noise. It would be like a picture of a horse. And then the generated image would be the picture of a horse but turned into a zebra. Um, or taking a picture of a dog and giving it cat features or something like that. So it doesn't always have to just be like some garbage noise. It can be actual other pieces of real data um, that we're trying to modify. Um, so quick question, uh, test your knowledge. What activation function outputs values in the range of negative one to one? Tan H. So that's what um, that's what almost always we're going to use as the uh, activation function for the output layer. So negative getting values between negative one gives us a lot more um, different ways to represent the the like the output instead of just doing values between zero and one. It's a little bit cleaner. Um, in in practice, it works better. Um, almost always, like works better than just doing between zero and one. You can just use sigmoid as the output for the generator and just get values between zero and one. Um, again, why this really the reason why this really works can only be kind of guessed at. We don't really have like a good um, like you know or like a true thing like saying okay, this is exactly why. But you know, it's it's reason that having a larger range of values can help give more representations for our uh, for our data that it's easier for the computer to work with um, yeah so let me check here the drink all right so we talked about like different ways we can upsample and things like that that's really it. That's our generator, and that's our discriminator. So there's this networks that we've kind of seen before working in slightly different ways in order to get what we're trying to accomplish here, our main goal. So, um, but now, now that we have knowledge of like how both of these works, how do they actually combine together?
and this is where this is the fun part here so here's a here's um, how we're gonna actually go through our training process here of the combined models so first we're gonna start over here so we're gonna generate M samples from generators so M just being some number like 30 whatever our bat size is so 32 64 whatever so we're gonna generate M samples from the generator M samples from real data and um, well, we're not generating from the real data. We're just taking M samples from the real data. And we're going to generate M samples from the generator. Um, we're going to feed these into the discriminator and actually calculate um, a loss. So how well did the discriminator classify these as fake and these as real? And then update the parameters uh, for the discriminator. So now we're going to take this updated discriminator model. And what we're going to do is, um, we're going to jump down here actually. We're going to generate M samples from noise again. Uh, so same thing as up here. We're going to generate some some new uh, data, and then now we're going to get the discriminator output. So we're going to put these generated images just through the updated discriminator model. We're going to put those through, see how well the the generator fools the discriminator. Once we do that, we're going to calculate the generator loss. But instead of using fake labels, we're using we're going to use real labels because because if you think about it, the generator wants the wants the discriminator to output ones if we're using ones as our real label um, for its fake images because it wants to fool it so that's so we use one as our as our label because that's what the generator is trying to do it's trying to get the discriminator to generate one and then we calculate the loss from the discriminator back to the generator so we in this case we're calculating the loss of the generator through the discriminator, but we're not updating the discriminator model, just the generator model. And that's done right here. Once we update the generator, then this loop just continues again. We use our updated generator, calculate discriminator, update the discriminator param uh, parameters, um, see how well the generator is fooling the discriminator, up, uh, update the generator based on what the discriminator output is, and then keep going. So it's a little bit to take in, um, so let's take a minute and just make sure you can deconstruct this and understand. Um, I mean, the main thing is is that our discriminator is providing right here, um, where the discriminator is providing feedback um, to the generator based on how well it's doing, and that helps the generator update its parameters and get better data. So. Um, so just take a minute, look at this. Uh, there's also the speaker notes in the slides as well that have basically like a text explanation for that as well, if you would like to read that. All right. So how does this actually look then? So loss is calculated separately for each network. Each network will have its own optimizer function. Um, in this case, the discriminator is trying to do what to its loss? Take a second and think about that. Well, it's trying to minimize its loss, right? Um, it's trying to minimize its loss so it can, you know, detect the fake images and the real images correctly every time. So in this case, the generator is trying to do what to the discriminator's loss? So, minim so if the discriminator is trying to minimize its loss so it's detecting fake images as fake and real images as real, what is the generator trying to do? It's trying to maximize its loss, uh, the discriminator's loss, because maximizing would mean that the discriminator is then uh, calculating its images as fake, or calculating, sorry, calculating generating images as real, and that's what the generator's purpose is to try to do, to fool the discriminator. So, um, again, the main thing is the generator learns to generate output such that the discriminator classifies data as real. That's always our main goal here. And following, um, and then this is just another explanation of our training loop here. All right. Well, that is how GANs work. That is the basis of all GANs. It's really. It's nothing even um, really complicated or anything. It's really just thinking of, you know, kind of thinking outside the box on how we can combine multiple networks together to solve some problem. 
Um, and it's kind of weird to think of it as separate networks when they're kind of, you know, in, you know, in code and stuff, they're kind of seen as one network. But it's really interesting how we can actually, you know, split apart and things, you know, split this, um, these models apart into different sections and things like that. And as you can see as well, um, once we're done with the um, once we're done with the uh, training the generator, we just throw the discriminator away because we don't care about it classifying it anymore. Once the generator is actually outputting really good results, then we just care about the generator. So kind of the same way with the autoencoder. Well, once we have a really good encoder representation, usually we'll just throw away the, dis uh, the decoder unless we need it for outputs or something. All right. So let's relevant to talk about the little different some different types that you'll commonly see and then we can get started and uh, go into the workshop so DC GANs which is pretty much what we've used as our examples today um, this our GANs they just use convolutional layers in the network so they work with image data or audio or other things that would require you know convolutions um, so discriminator will use the convolution to extract features from the input in the generated data. Generator will use convolution to generate features from noise with the help of upsample layers or these convolutional transpose as they're called in PyTorch. Um, these these convolution uh, these special layers here will um, and this is a little diagram showing. So instead of like um, so normally. What we would have is is that in a convolution we would have some type of sliding level our kernel and then our kernel these are values of our filter and then all of these would could be convolved down to a single uh, number which would be our feature for uh, this window of data. Now the up the convolution transpose pretty much works the exact opposite. We start with some type of feature map here, and we take each number and we expand it out to whatever the size of our kernel is. In case this is a three by three kernel. So this one feature would then become nine separate values, um, kind of just basically like a reverse operation there of what the convolution does. So, and you can read up more about how actually the math works on this, but um, this is just conceptually, this is what's going on behind the scenes to actually get this output here, to be down here. All right. We also have some two other types of GANs, so conditional GAN. So a conditional GAN is works just like a regular GAN. You, know, you can put your random noise or whatever um, and into the generator and get the output. The generator also takes another input, which is an embedded label vector, to generate a piece of data from a specific class. So what this generator does is, is that you provide it some random noise and a label, and this label will basically say, I want to generate a cat or a dog or a horse or you know whatever you're trying to generate, a house. And so to generate, so you can kind of control what the output of the generator is instead of just inputting some random noise and just getting, you know, whatever. Uh, you don't know what you're going to get out of it. This can help you control, like, what, what your output is. And the discriminator will have an extra output as well. So it still determine, you know, images as real or fake, but also try to predict the class of the real or fake image as well. So this will help the generator actually learn which classes to generate or how to generate uh, different classes based on, uh, the embedded label vector, and by embedded, um, if you take, if you remember the um, our RNN workshop where we talked about embedding layers and things like that, being able to represent classes as a low-level uh, feature, a low-level um, a vector of numbers, uh, and that's what this embedding means. So you can take a look back at that if you want a little bit more information of how like embedding works. So what if you want some further control on the output of the generator? Well, that's where InfoGANs come in. So InfoGANs are really cool, and they're also really, really hard to train. And we're going to talk about here in a second that GANs are really finicky, and they're actually very difficult to train and actually get good results. They're could very easy fall, they're very easy fall apart if you don't get everything kind of like just perfect. And we'll talk about why that is and some ways to fix, fix those things. Um, an info GAN um, works, you know, does the same thing as a regular GAN. Um, so, in, but remember with a regular GAN that we've talked about, the only thing we tune is the noise input. So if we're just generating random noise, for example, and not just, and not using like other images or things like that, um, we can't really like control the noise to get what we want. Like, cause we don't know like what each value in the noise is actually doing for the generator. We just, I mean, we can, it's basically like, you know, 
we, we can there, there are a bunch of like knobs and stuff that we can turn but we don't know what any of the knobs do or how they work together to actually generate the output so we're just kind of flying blind it'll be really hard to actually figure out what is going on um, and that's where an info gain comes in so we um, we include a latent code vector as another input to the generator as along with the noise um, and what this this whole thing is saying right here is basically saying that the this latent code the generator will learn to um, each um, this latent code will be a vector and the generator will actually learn what each uh, number in this vector is actually what feature you're going to be tuning so think a bit think of it as you have um, say like a vector of like 10 numbers each of these numbers you can think of as like a knob that you can turn but these knobs aren't just like random noise where you don't know what they're doing each knob you know what's going on so the first knob so say for generating pictures of dogs the first knob would be like maybe like ear type or in the second knob is like nose type and then the third knob would be like kind of like face structure or something like that or fourth knob would be like coats you know uh, coat color or coat you know um, type or things like that um, so, you know, when it's training, when the, when the um, model is training uh, with the InfoGAN, we don't know what, those, uh, what each of those knobs are, do are doing, but at the end, we can then test each knob and then say, like, oh, we can very easily say, like, what's it's changing, because the, um, because the generator um, has learned to actually, um, to basically, um, with all the noise uh, in the image, actually be able to relate it to each number in this latent vector code and with that we're able to meaningfully modify the noise input to the data so we can uh, get whatever generated image we want so we can keep tuning the knobs and actually get a dog that we're looking for like a certain breed or whatever so this is actually really finicky but the infogams are really cool because they allow us to pretty much create models where we can just generate whatever we want and we don't have to like just input a bunch of random noise and hope for the best. We can to fine tune it to the perfect, you know, whatever we want to generate. And the, and that's like it's really awesome. Um, and there's resources at the end of these slides that could that um, can you can learn more about all these types of networks and how to create them and things like that. So all right. Um, our final part of the slides is going to be GAN tuning, and like I said, there's a lot of, uh, these are some common issues, but there's a lot of issues that GANs can have. So, our discriminator, uh, check that's still going good, yep. So, our discriminator is, uh, can have some very common issues like loss dropping to zero or generator loss going to infinity and is outputting garbage. Um, you know, a huge issue with a GAN is that our generator output, um, you know, is, is more qualitative to actually um, know like what's going on or to know if it's doing well, I mean. So what I mean by that is the discriminator can be like, oh, you know, like I, I can't, I'm getting fooled. Like, I don't know if I'm, if it, this image is real or fake. And so the generator is like, oh yes, I'm doing a good job. And, but the actual output of the generator could just be like just complete garbage. And so in that case is that everything on paper with the loss and everything is work is looking good, but our actual output of the generator is just garbage. And that's like a, you know, that's a huge problem because we can't really tell the computer, yeah, this looks bad because the computer has no idea what that even means. It just has like, you know, a loss function and stuff to go off. Um, so it makes it a lot harder to train these type of networks is because a lot of the, it's just basically qualitative um, output because it's really, we have to judge it whether it's good or not. Um, so there's a lot of problems where the networks, whether you have like loss going to infinity or dropping to zero, they're just not training or learning anything. Um, the GAN can actually learn the wrong features of data to generate. Um, and what I mean by it doesn't learn or train anything is that your input, your input uh, training data has to be, has to have a lot of relatable features in order for the GAN uh, network, the generator network, to be able to extract what features the all the images have in common and be able to generate that. I mean, if you're just throwing in a bunch of images of dogs, but for example, the dogs are like in different places of the image, or they're not, or they're like um, very like they're they're not 
say if you're they're not all like the same so like say if your data is noisy and you have like cats in there too that can like really throw it off or if like they're not in the same place in the image and things like that because uh, what you did notice too is that um, I never talked about max pooling or any type of pooling layers and, the, and we'll go more into this for workshop we actually don't use pooling layers in the GANs so a uh, big issue you have with GANs is that um, all your you know your features and stuff need to be within the same area of the image to be able to correlate them um, so that's a big issue as well um, and there's ways to get around that which we'll talk about in the workshop but those are some very common issues um, so these are some general tips just for getting better output um, a big thing is using soft labels for real and fake data instead of using ones and zeros you can do 0 0.1 or 0 0.9 or like flipping these labels um, so that just kind of helps smooth out the loss functions and uh, so the generator discriminator can work better um, why this happens I couldn't really tell you it's again a lot of this is black box magic so it's kind of hard to tell what exactly this is helping them the network do but we can just see the results that it's making the uh, loss uh, usually nine times out of ten will smooth out the loss and make the training go a lot better um, batch normalization is a pretty big thing and again so including these after a convolutional uh, operations but before the activation function and this is very important um, batch normalization is al usually always done before our, our actual activation um, and in the generator uh, there's also the um, using larger kernel size so again this is just kind of uh, just some general tips there you know using larger kernel size will be able to actually extract more um, be able to look at larger windows um, and be able to overall being able to uh, correlate features between images a lot better instead of like really small kernel sizes and cap capturing the very fine details um, when the generator should have some larger kernel sizes to be able to capture correlation some much, much larger cor correlations between each of the image data and that'll help the generator a lot better um, and a big thing is that for the discriminator, as you'll see, we pretty much always use leaky ReLU for uh, activations. So leaky ReLU is just a, um, um, a ReLU, so a rectified linear unit, that can sometimes output negative values. It's like a random chance to somehow let a negative value slip by. Um, and that just helps a little bit with, um, since our outputs uh, of our generator are normally going to be tan H between negative 1 and 1. Um, so if we just pass that through ReLU, basically all those negative values can always get zeroed out. So the leaky ReLU will help actually retain some of that information as it goes through the network of the negative values. But yeah, I mean, uh, so these are just some general tips that if you're not having, if you're having issues to follow, but um, I mean, there could be a lot more issues like say, like again, your data, your input uh, training data could just be um, just not very clean. Um, and if you're, and a big part um, of any neural networks to make sure you're making sure when you're training it to have clean data, but for GANs especially, it, it, you will highly benefit from making sure you have really clean, uh, good data to work off of. And as you can see, uh, as you will see in our workshop, is that our data uh, that we're going to be using is extremely clean. We're going to be generating human faces, and each face is cropped in the very center, so all the faces are, pretty, are in the same exact position of the image, all in the center, all the same size. All of them, you know, human faces are, you know, they all look, have a lot of similar features, so again, that, that part's already done. So, you know, that's also really important. Um, any little errors you can do in your model and stuff that normally won't affect other networks too much can really affect GANs here. So it's important to make sure that you, you're looking through your models and making sure they're done, you know, they're built correctly and things like that as well. Yeah. Um, so here's some different resources. You can pull up the slides and click these hyperlinks here. Um, you know, thank you for, uh, you know, coming through the slides. I'm sorry that's a little bit... Uh, different but as you, you know social distancing and stuff so we can't you know meet up in person um, but I hope you still found this very informative um, and you're able to follow along you know at a reasonable pace and stuff um, the benefit of this is too you know you could speed up the video to time speed and things like that so to help you learn um, our next part we're gonna go into our workshop now um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, we'll be like a fade we'll fade into the workshop and we'll get started so thank you all all right welcome back uh be doing a workshop 
uh, portion now of the meeting. Um, so I just had to relocate a little bit, change for um, where I'm recording here. Um, yeah, so I'll walk through how we open up our notebooks as usual, and then we'll get started. All right, so first uh, we'll go to our website, ucfai.org, head over to core. Give it a minute to load. Um, by the way, this workshop will take, when you pull up the notebook, will take a few minutes to load because it's a lot of files. Um, so give yourself probably like three to five minutes to load up the data. Uh, I already have mine loaded here, so we'll just get right into it. Uh, so we're going to go to our Spring 2020 uh, edition for our core group. And then scroll all the way down. Uh, we already have the slides posted here, and then you're just going to click follow along on Kaggle, and I'll pull up our notebook on Kaggle. Um, I already have it pulled up here, and then just, uh, this will say copy and edit, so you just click that, and then it'll pull right up. All right, so look behind Deepfake. Let's get started. Uh, let me full screen. There we go. All right, so... First things first, we're just going to define our data dic uh, directory, um, and then uh, we'll get started here. So our purpose of this workshop is we're going to be creating some new celebrities. Um, so generating human faces is a pretty introductory uh, data set to uh, working with GANs uh, that can give you some impressive results, and you know it's not too difficult. Uh, since human faces have a lot of relatable features, it's usually easier to create a GAN to actually generate these faces on other domains. Um, so um, our data set actually has a lot of data. So we have 200,000 images of celebrities' faces. So all of them are already center aligned, so all the faces are in the center of the image, um, which is very helpful because, again, if we had faces in different parts of the uh, image across our data set, the GAN would have a hard time or would probably not even learn uh, the, the different features between human faces. Um, so that's really important that the the data is localized to the same areas between um, same areas in the image, um, unless you do some some data manipulation and stuff to and build your model in such a way where uh, you can get around that, which is a little outside the scope of this workshop, uh, but you can look that up. Um, so, um, and again, GANs are finicky, uh, so um, we usually will need to do a lot of da data pre-processing and stuff. As, but as I said, the data set's already kind of ready to go. Um, and we'll be using DC GANs since we're working with image data. So we'll be using deep convolutional GANs uh, to, for our, both our generator and discriminator. So, all right, well, let's uh, get started. So again, we're just going to import some data. Um, if you want to uh, follow along here uh, with like what I'm doing, if you, uh, you can define a seed here. So like the random, so you'll get like the same uh, randomly generated weights and noise as I do, uh, just to kind of like compare, it basically get exact same results, or you don't have to. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and use this seed here. Uh, so if you want to use that, I'll run that. I was gonna install a torch summary here and um, this is kind of this is the same from the RNN workshop, kind of like a just a, a function for uh, printing the iterations of epics and just kind of like a, a a general way, so you don't have to like customize it every single time. It's something you kind of just throw in to print your stuff. Um, so a few different ways to do that, and this will download Torch Summary here. All right. So let's define our data set and data loader. Um, again, we're gonna, since we're working with image data, we're gonna use PyTorch's image folder, which was used in the CN workshop and for our applications. Um, so the only thing with the, um, with the image folder is that we don't need the classes because we're not training on any classes. We're just training on the data itself. Uh, we'll see how to work with that later. Um, and also 200,000 images is a lot of images. So for training on a full data set, it'll take about 30, uh, about 30 to 35 minutes on Kaggle. Uh, so 
I have an appropriately named variable called Thanos level, and this this basically just cuts the data set in different sizes. So, like a uh, a level of four will just um, uh, cut the data set into uh, fourths. You can do three for thirds, second for halves. So uh, for this one, um, and this is only for five epics too. It will take about thirty thirty to five minutes. Half will take about fifteen. A fourth will take about six. So we're gonna for best results, you're gonna want to use the whole data set. For this workshop, we're just going to go with um, just using a fourth of the data set so the training's quick. Um, which in this case, um, I may also include the 30 minute training as well since I can cut it cut it in. Uh, we'll see. Um, so for um, we also need to, again with our image folder, we're going to define our transforms. Uh, so for the image, so these transforms will do all of our um, data manipulate our image manipulation, so that's resizing, normalizing. Uh, things like that. So, um, so it's gonna we're gonna um, gonna resize our image to a pretty small size. So it's, again, for speed purposes, so 64 by 64. Um, so it's a pretty small size. Um, we're, they're already are, the images are already center cropped, but we just provide another center crop just to make sure like we, every image is exactly uh, cropped the same because um, even though all the images are originally uh, cropped in the center if you depending on the resize it could mess some things up so doing a center crop through PyTorch will make sure like um, that all of them are exactly lined up um, and then our normalizing it uh, we're just normalizing the data with a standard deviation and mean of 0 0.5 so that so that and this normalizing with a SCD and mean of zero point five will give us uh, values between negative one and one. All right, uh, so you can define the Thanos level here. Um, these are just uh, you know some general stuff: bat size, image size, number of workers. Um, so here we're going to need to implement our actual data loader. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that now. Um, so you can just follow along with me and type this out. Uh, so we're going to define it. We're going to call it data loader. Um, so we're going to create a new data loader based on our data set. Um, this uh, random split, which you've seen in, I think, I think you saw that in the applications, pretty sure. Um, but this random split will um, will split some type of PyTorch data set. Um, but the way it splits, it splits based on uh, indices. So what this is basically give a list of indices to split on. Um, depending on the Thanos, the Thanos level. So this is a bit of math of that. You can't just put in like 0 0.5 for like a 50% split. You have to actually define 50, uh, list out the indices of 50% of the data set. So that's kind of like what this is doing here. All right, so we're gonna define this on data set. We'll set our shuffle to true. Give it our batch size variable and our num workers variable, which is defined above, okay. Um, no, that's it. So now we got our data loader, and then we'll also this will print some uh, some training images so we can see what we're working with as well. So we'll give this a run. Again, it's a lot of data to work through, so take a second to run. So don't worry. Um. And then we'll see a, uh, a batch of, um, we'll see a single batch of real images. Let's see what we're working with. I highly recommend that um, this is kind of a, like a bigger data set and a larger model. So if you have a DPU, at home and you would like to go through setting up the environment and stuff locally um, the environment um, with you can clone our uh, github core repo and it has like the environment and everything uh, using anaconda to set up so I'd recommend doing that um, because I you know any DPU you have if it's like you know a new a newer DPU will perform better than it is on Kaggle so Personally, I use a 1060 and uh, NVIDIA uh, DTX 1060, and that's able to perf usually perform um, better than on um, Kaggle. Six gigabytes of VRAM, so that's what I would recommend. And this is taking a long time. 
All right, we'll come back to this once this is done loading here. I'll talk about the generator now. Um, so first we're gonna define our generator. Um, so I've created this function here, a generator block that will define a, like a block of, uh, like a single block of the generator, which will involve a convolutional transpose 2D. Again, this is kind of like a reverse convolutional layer, a batch norm and our activation, which we're just gonna use standard ReLU. Um, and uh, we're gonna use this to create our model. Um, and then the get padding function, same as we've seen before in all of our previous um, uh, workshops working with data, uh, image data. So it's just a way to get us padding. So in this case, our padding, um, so if we're going Fleming 32 to 64, and our kernel sizes, we're gonna be using four with a stride of two. Um, our padding is gonna be one, this will print out. So you can use this function in order to get your padding. Uh, this is still running here. Um, and um, so it's important when you're going through the, um, uh, the when you're building the model to keep track of the size and the feature maps and networks get steeper because you want to make sure your final output layer is uh, the correct size. Um, you don't want it to do too big or too small or have it weird or your padding gets messed up. Um, so a good thing after this workshop to see, which will definitely increase your training times, but see if you can generate some, some much higher resolution images. So 128 by 128, so you'll have to add some extra layers and stuff. And this is done running. Um, so we got 50,000, roughly 50,000 images, and then with about 400 batches in our data loader, because our batch size is pretty large, so we're using a very large batch size at 128. And here's a, here's a sample of batch images, you can see here. So probably recognize quite a few of these celebrities. All right. So as you can see, a lot of them, they're all, they're all center cropped, all in the same part of the image. Uh, a few of them are a little off, depending on like the angle of the face, but it seems like all of them are correct. Um, but yeah, let's get into creating a generator now. So you see here, we get a padding of one. Um, so here's our generator. So our generator is going to take the number of input channels, uh, the input size, which will, the input size in this case would be the size of our noise, because um, uh, we're just going to be using random noise to actually generate, and then our output size uh, and our output dimension was going to be uh, 64 by 64. So we're just going to define those local variables, and then self dot layers is going to call this function build layers that actually is going to uh, build the layers of our model here, which is defined here. So we're gonna start with this, em uh, this empty list of layers. So it's gonna keep track of all of our layers in our model. Um, our in channels and our out channels, these are these two variables we're gonna be using. So for our first layer, our in channels is gonna be the input size. Our out channels is gonna be self dot output size times eight. So it's just pretty much um, this times eight, uh, we're gonna start with a deep network, remember? So we're gonna start with um, an in channels of three. Um, so, and is it three? Yes. So an in channels of three for each of the noises. And then our out channels is actually going to be a, a very deep. So we're going to go with, we're going to start with the high amount of channels because our, after our first convolution, we're going to start with a very deep network and it's going to get shallower and shallower as we go through until the output it channels is three as well. Um, so here's our first block. So our dimension after this is going to become um, our out channel and then four by four. So we're gonna do a gen block with our, put our input or output channels, kernel size of four, stride of one, and so, and we don't need padding for this one. And then now our in channels is gonna be our previous out channels. And then our new out channels, we're just gonna divide uh, whatever our multiplier here is by two. So this is eight, this is gonna go four, and then it's gonna go two and then one. Um, so our job here to implement is going to be implementing the uh, the next two blocks of the generator. Oh, I'm, I missed uh, I missed uh, one. It's going to go from so we're going to go from four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two to sixty-four. So we see we have four, um, and we have thirty-two and sixty-four. So we need to implement uh, our next two blocks for eight and sixteen. So let's do that real quick. Um, we're going to be following pretty much the general structure, and then um, we're going to be using the same um, a kernel size and a stride of two, um, and we are, we're going to need to figure out the padding. 
Um, so layers, um, remember you can do plus equal. Um, so you know gen block uh, function returns a list of layers, so in this case three level layers. And when you add this, and when you add list in Python, you concatenate the list. So it basically takes whatever this list, and then add all the values in this list, it's gonna add to the end of, append it to the end of the layers, or current layers of our tracking list. Um, so we're gonna generate a block. Do in, uh, we're gonna plug in in C or out C four, we're gonna use a stride of two. Now um, here we're going, so either we can um, run the function up here and get the value and hard code the value or just uh, plug in um, this function here. So we'll hard code the value for this one. So let's see, we're going from, uh, our input is four and we're gonna be going to eight. So our input size is gonna be four. We're gonna do an eight. And then our uh, kernel size is four with a stride of two. And our padding is one. And we'll find that our padding is gonna be one for the rest of these as well. Uh, we're gonna update our in C to become our new out C. And then we're gonna out C, um, we're gonna wanna do self.output size times two. Uh, Cause we're, again, we're just having eight, four, two, um, and then uh, one which will just become self.output size. So this is gonna be for our, uh, so our dimension is gonna be out C by eight by eight. And then now let's do our 16 by 16 version, or step. So that's gonna be 16 by 16. So again, we're following the same process. So the gen, this gen block function makes it just where we can um, make our code a bit cleaner here. And we're just following the same step for each one, just changing our values. Out C, four, two, one. In C, it's gonna be out C. And then now our out C is gonna be what? Uh, take a second to maybe, I mean, I've already said this, but just type it out yourself before I do. It's gonna be uh, just our self dot output size. Uh, so we're going four, two, you can say like this times one, but we don't need to add that. And then there you go, that's gonna be our generator. So after that, um, our, it's, our out C is gonna be, uh, uh, so this is the channels, remember, not like the actual dimension of the size. So at this case, um, our, um, our output size is defined as our output dimension. So at this point, we're gonna have 64 channels. Um, at this point, we're gonna have uh, only three channels. So this will go from 64 to three channels. Um, and then this will be our final output, that's 64 by 64. So this is like kind of like our final resize. So at this point, it's 32 by 32 um, times, our previous, uh, times our previous out C. So in this case, this will be 64, and then uh, this will become three, since out C is gonna be self dot channels, so it will be three by 64 by 64. And since this is in our output layer, we're not gonna use a batch norm, and we're gonna use tan H as our output, so um, this doesn't use the den block method. And then return uh, an NN sequential based on all these layers, and that's what self dot build layers. So our forward pass is really easy, we're just passing it through our layers, and then squeezing just removes any extraneous uh, dimensions of one. So if you have like a, a, an array that's like of dimension 16 comma one, squeeze will just make that an array of dimension 16. So it just removes any dimensions of one. All right, make sure we run that. No errors, great. So now let's do the discriminator. So the discriminator will just be like a simple convolutional network that we've seen before, nothing fancy, except we're just using some different um, activations like leaky radius. Um, you can click this link here to learn a little bit more about it. Um, but pretty much all it, all it has is it has a chance to leak negative values from the function output instead of zeroing out all values all the time. Um, this will get better results for the discriminator since our outputs are between negative one and one from our generator. So you're not just zeroing out all those values. Um, um, so in order to have the input size down, uh, we're not gonna use max pooling. Um, so generally, pretty much all the time, using max pooling in GANs is never used. 
um, as it also this creates models that don't train because um, it it removes the features necessary for the generator to learn. So max pooling will help the discriminator actually you know create have better output uh, for max pooling. But when we actually have those gradients flow backwards and uh, the generator will not be able to learn anything because the max pooling removes a lot of those features that the generator needs in order to in order to learn how to generate better data. So instead, uh, we use uh, when we con when we convolve, we're going to use larger strides in our convolutional layers, and these larger strides will kind of mimic the effect of max pooling. Um, uh, it won't well, it won't it won't actually max pool, but it'll it'll have the effect of having down our input size. So um, so it's reducing the dimensionality of the input size, so we we don't have like a really large model. Um, so that's a very uh, important uh, note to make there about max pooling or any type of pooling layers. Um, and again, remember batch normalization we're going to be using uh, before our activation and after our convolution. And our generator blocks this can be a convolutional 2D, a batch norm, and a leaky ReLU. This alpha value is basically uh, the 0 0.2 is the chance to leak pretty much. So there's like a 20% chance to like leak a value, a uh, negative value that is. All right, so our input to our discriminator, well, how many input channels in our input dimension size? So we're, we have 64 by 64 by three input. So we have uh, input dimension 64, channels is three, and then we have the same build layers function. Um, and we're basically kind of going the reverse of the, uh, the generator. So this goes from like 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. We're gonna go from 64, 32, um, 16, 8, 4, 1. Um, all right, so we got to build the next two blocks. So let's go ahead and do that. Quite similar to the general generator, indeed. So you can follow along with me. Plus equals. We're gonna call our discrim block method defined above. Pass in our out C. Uh, we're using the same kernel sizes as the generator, and it's gonna have the same padding to make this nice and easy. Of course, if you're using different sizes and stuff, you can just use the get padding method to get whatever padding you need for right here. Um, so our NC is going to be out C, out C, self dot input. So we start here at self dot input dimension, um, uh, which is 64, and then we're going to go deeper. So how this started at 8 and went all the way down to self dot channels. This is going to start at self dot channels with the first convolution, because in this case, um, the self dot channels will be, uh, in channels are gonna be three. And then it's gonna go from 64 to 128 and so on and so forth. Um, so this is gonna be times four. And then our next block. Four, two, one. And C is gonna equal our out channels. Oops. And then our channel is going to equal self dot input dimension times eight. And then our final output channel is just going to be one since we're just going to be, we're just going to, our output size is going to be one. Um, so something special we see here, we don't actually have a linear layer as our output layer uh, for like a, or a fully connected layer. And the reason why is, is that as it turns out, the way we built this model, um, after after down, downsizing multiple times, this last this last channel uh, or this last convolution, we'll have an output channel of one as we're setting here, and our input channel is going to be whatever um, it's going to be self dot um, input dimension times eight, and our output channel is going to be one. When you actually do our last convolution here, it makes the input uh, dimension, the width and the height, become one. So the output of this convolutional layer uh, is just going to be a one by one by one node, which is just one node. And that one node is just going to contain our single value, whether it's real or fake. So it pretty much eliminates the need for the um, for any type of classifier layer because it's, the output's already like just one node. Um, this doesn't work. This is a kind of a special case. This won't work for everything. So at the end here, you would just have a, um, some type of flat global average pool or whatever. Um, 
well, in this case, you can use a global average pool just to kind of flatten it, or you can just flatten the values. Um, you just don't want a pooling during inside any of the blocks here. And then, um, and then you know, user classifiers and stuff as we've seen before in the CNN uh, workshop. But in this case, the special case, make, uh, case makes it uh, really easy. Our output is just one by one, and we just use sigmoid because we just want values between zero and one. Um, so values closer to zero uh, will be fake, and class values closer to one will be real, which we're gonna, those are the labels we'll be using. So let's run this. Okay, no errors, looks good. So if you so um, in the slides and at the end of this uh, notebook, we do um, I link the um, uh, to the DC GAN paper. So this DC GAN paper was the original paper to actually um, define a deep convolutional GAN, um, and they found some things to help it learn a lot better. Uh, one of the things they found was that um, initializing the weights in a certain way can really help training. Um, so following the DC GAN vapor, they initialized the uh, convolutional weights from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and then a standard deviation of two. And then batch normalization layer uh, weights were randomized from a normal uh, distribution with a mean of one and a standard deviation of 0 0.2. Um, so what this function does is that if it's a convolutional layer, um, it's gonna initialize uh, from a normal distribution, just like it says up here. And if it's a batch norm, We'll normalize it from that way. Um, and PyTorch makes it a very easy way to actually just apply a function to initialize weights to all the weights in the model. So that's what that'll do there. All right, so we built our models and we define how to initialize our weights. So we're ready to get all our stuff ready, like our optimizer, our loss function, you know, things like that to get ready to train. So as you can see here, our den input, we're just gonna use 100. So there's gonna be 100 values for noise at each of the RDB layers. So it'll be 100 by 100 by 100 and for each of those layers and there's a bunch of random noise. Um, yep, our output's gonna be 64 because it's 64 by 64 by three. Um, this, this applies how, when we take a model, so our model is gonna be a generator model and we call the uh, PyTorches.apply method. Uh, this will apply the weight, uh, this weight function uh, that we created to generate all of the weights in the model. All right, for a discriminator, uh, our channels are going to input channels are going to be three channels, and our input size is going to be our gen output, which is a 64 by 64. Again, we're going to apply the weights. Um, here we're going to get CUDA. Make sure you're using a DPU for this one. Uh, if you try to use CPU, you're going to have a bad time. Um, so we're gonna, and then we're gonna put our models to our device. From DC GAN paper, this is the learning rate they started using. Um, and you're gonna see something here, and then we are gonna need to define our optimizers. Remember, our generator and discriminator are gonna use different optimizers, but we're only gonna have one loss function. Um, so you'll see here what these betas are. So let me scroll back up here. So the DC GAN paper states that the, um, that the atom optimizer, just what its default values, is too aggressive in reducing the learning rate. So if you don't know, the atom optimizer has what's called um, um, a dynamic reduction of learning rate. So what happens is if, it, if the optimizer sees that our model is converging, so like it's not improving um, as it's training, it'll dynamically decrease the learning rate um, and decreasing the learning will help the model just push it a little bit more to try to, um, to get to push more accuracy and stuff out of the model. Uh, when it seems like it's starting to convert. The atom optimizer by default is pretty aggressive in doing that. Right when it sees it starts plateauing, it'll start reducing the learning rate dynamically. Um, but if for GANs, what, for DC GANs, what they found in this paper is that it's too aggressive and, it's ca and it causes the model to um, stop training very quickly because it, it reduces the learning rate too quickly and the generator is not able to learn. Um, so um, to define this behavior, it's defined in these betas. So originally, these betas are just, um, I think they're both 0 0.999. Um, we're just going to make our first one 0 0.5, which is we're just, all this is saying we're reducing the behavior, uh, the aggressiveness of how much it reduces the learning rate. So instead of reducing the learning rate, like the second it detects like, um, that we're converging, it'll wait a little bit uh, before actually reducing it. Um, very quickly here, we're just going to define our loss. So 
remember our loss uh, criterion, which we're, that's what we're going to call it. Um, we're just going to be using binary cross entropy, so we're just going to call this binary cross entro oops, entropy loss. Um, let me make sure I spelled that right. Uh, yep, uh, it's called BCE loss in PyTorch. BCE loss. There you go. So binary cross entropy, because again, we only have labels of 0 and 1. Um, we're also going to define fixed noise. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to, um, for the purposes of visualization, we're going to visualize how this model performs across um, across as it learns through the different epics. Uh, so we're going to use the same noise to generate each uh, uh, to generate sample images um, as we're training. So at the end, we can see on the same type on the same noise. Uh, how well it generates uh, the fake uh, image is in this case the fake celebrities. Um, we're also gonna, so if you want, you can change up our real and fake labels here, so you can easily do that. And we're going to print the summaries of our models. So let's run that. Uh oh. Uh, looks like I forgot to run this cell. Make sure you run your code. All right, using CUDA, that's good. All right, and then also viewing the summary here is a very good uh, visualization to make sure you define your model op outputs correctly. Because if you define them incorrectly, um, the, everything will work up until when you try to start training and then it will give you errors. It will give you some weird errors. So this is a good to check that. So we go from 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. So our output's good. About three and a half million parameters there. And then from here, we're going from 64, so we're going from 32, 16, 8, 4, and 1. So our output is just going to be a 1 by 1 by 1, which is just base, which is just one node uh, for the discriminator. And about 2.7, 2.8 million parameters. All right, everything looks good. So let's start training. So remember our training uh, steps. So our steps that we're going to follow. Um, so in the so in the slides we kind of said okay we're going to train on real and fake data and then you know do that. Um, so in our PyTorch we're going to need a little be a little bit more verbose on how we're actually doing that. So for our steps that we're going to follow is that we're going to train the discriminator. So in this case we're going to feed um, the real images in first, calculate the loss, and then perform back propagation to get all of our weight updates. We're going to feed the fake images in, calculate the loss, and then backprop through the discriminator. Now it's important that you don't mix up your real and fake images and then just perform, uh, calculate the loss on all of them at once. Um, what I found is, is that it, the model will not be able to train. And you'll find from most other people, you always want to train either one or the other first. Most people will train the real images first and then the fake images. Why this happens? Um, you can look up for some other explanations and opinions why, but nobody really knows like why that happens. Um, but this is just like um, this is the follow steps. It's like don't mix up the images. So we're gonna feed the real admin, calculate loss. Once we have um, all those uh, weight updates, then we're gonna use our call our optimizer um, to actually update the weights. Uh, so remember when we perform back props, we're just getting the gradients. Uh, to update the weights, but we're, we're actually not updating the weights until we call our optimizer to do so. Um, and we're going to sum the losses as well. All right, so next step. Ta um, after that, we're going to train our generator once we have our updated discriminator model. So to train our generator, we're going to take our fake images um, and we're going to feed them into the discriminator model again. However, the labels, um, you can generate new fake images. So in this one, I just take the same ones that are already generated, but you can just take new ones, doesn't matter. Um, so however, remember, we're going to use labels of one instead of zero because the purpose of the generator, when it passes it, um, um, pictures into the discriminator, it wants to get outputs of one to say that, okay, it fooled the generator successfully. Um, so that's what our labels are going to be for the generator. And then we calculate and then we calculate loss for the generator based on the discriminator's output. So we take our discriminator output, but we use that to find the loss of the generator, and then we update the generator's uh, weights using the optimizer. And then we just keep doing that until we're done. So let's go through the code here. So we're going to start at start time, and then this is going to store all of our generated images to track them throughout our training. The generator and discriminator are going to have separate losses here. And then this is going to be like the epic time to the um, time each epic.
So in this case, our data from the data loader is going to be um, an image and a label. But since we don't care about labels, since we're just worried, we only care about the image data, um, we're just going to just scrap the, um, the labels and just call data. So data zero in this case is just going to be uh, the actual data. Data one is just going to be the label, which we don't care about. I'm also going to want to get the batch size, um, which is images.size.0, the first dimension of the images is going to be the batch size. And we do this because we're going to need to create, uh, generate our labels and stuff. So torch.full will basically fill this array with whatever labels we have. So it's going to, in this case, it's going to fill it with real label and have size, batch size. And automatically put it on our uh, CUDA device here. All right, so let's train on the real data. So we plug in our images, we get our output, plug it through our criterion with our labels, and then we perform backprop. So here we're gonna generate, we're gonna create some um, random noise, generate some fake images, um, and then get our output on the fake images. So it's important here that we need to call this detach method. So what this does is detach the fake images from the computational graph of the generator. So what that means, um, so basically under the hood of PyTorch, all your models are what are called computational graphs. And when you get the output of a model, the output of the model is still linked to the, 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 uh, the computational graph or all the steps it took to get to that output. So we need to detach it from that output. Otherwise, if we call this here, it's going to try to backprop across the generator, and that's going to cause a lot of issues because we're not updating the generator right now. We're only updating the discriminator. So we got to make sure we call this attach method here. We're going to get a loss for our fake here, uh, for our fake images, call backward. We're going to add those two up and then call our optimizer to actually step through and update all the weight updates. All right, so that's our discriminator step here, uh, updating the discriminator, now the generator. So the generator is a little bit easier uh, here. So we're going to zero out our gradients, fill with our real label, again, because we're going to be updating the generator on real labels uh, based on the discriminator. We're going to get our output from our updated discriminator model on the fake images. In this case, we're not going to call the de dot detach because we want to update the generator at this point. So these fake images are linked to the generator, uh, which is important. Um, unlike up here when we called the attach. We're gonna get our criterion with the output of this and our labels, which in this case are gonna be our real labels. And then all we gotta do is call backward and step because again, we're calculating our loss based on the output, which is just gonna be, uh, which is on these fake images. So this is gonna back propagate through the discriminator up to the generator um, and then update the parameters of the generator. But in this case, we're calculating the loss based on the discriminator, but our optimizer is only up, uh, updating the weights of the generator. So in this, in this step here, the discriminator model weights are not updated. And that's very important because uh, we're not training the discriminator right now. You don't want to update both at once. Otherwise, I'll just, everything will just fall apart and you'll get a lot of errors. Uh, you got to uh, do this one step at a time. So that's training. So that's how we train again. Uh, the rest of this is just for printing and saving images. Uh, so again, we print every iteration, uh, just, just grabs our fake images and appends them to a um, thing. We're going to have a nice cool little animation at the end to kind of go through and we can see how it, um, in real time, how it, uh, how it um, performs as it trains. Um, yeah. So we're going to run this. This is going to take about six minutes. I'm gonna cut it here and fade into when it's done. So you can see here it starts done. All right, so training is done. We'll take a look here. So it's okay if your losses jump around like really high too. They'll come back down here. So each epic took about 1.7 minutes and to train on this took about seven minutes to train five epics. Got some pretty low loss value, so this is looking good. All right, so let's view the results. So let's look at, um, we can look at a little animation here, and this is gonna be um, the same, so just remember, this is the same noise, so same exact input across multiple training uh, as it trains. Um, so, and then you'll see towards the end that it actually produces some pretty good results with just a minimum amount of training. So here's the animation here, so we're gonna, start this here you press the play button so you can see here immediately as you can see here it's got like general outline of the faces and features you can kind of see the eyes and the mouth 
start to appear some hair well, it looks a little demonic it's okay if you'll see some demonic uh, outputs like that one <laughs> um, as it's um, outputting you get some pretty funny stuff um, but as you can see towards the end you can see the features are starting to become a lot clearer you can actually start seeing the eyes now uh, skin tones are normal you got some hair um, yeah so as you can see here our final output is um, this will this is um, final output here our final output is this <laughs> there's still some demented look, looking stuff here but you can see there's also some really good outputs here and here so again this wasn't trained on a lot of um, you know only on fourth of our data set and only trained for five epics so with a lot more training and some more data you can definitely get some way better results so this is just kind of like a proof of concept really but as you can see here, even with this minimal training, I mean, this is all generated from the model. It's able to learn features of the human face, the smiles, the eyes, hair colors, um, different poses from the faces, things like that, different facial expressions. So most of them seem to be smiling, um, but you can see some other, other ones here, um, the teeth and stuff. So let's take a look at um, how this looks compared to a real batch. So you see here's some real images, here's some fake images. So so you could definitely tell the difference obviously but um, you know with just some more training and stuff you can get results that are crystal clear um, and you can look up you know there's a lot of people that have done a lot of time in the generating really clear human faces and you can generate I mean we're at a point now where we can generate um, human faces that look nearly ident like indistinguishable from an actual um, uh, from a real face from a generate from the generated face so yeah, so uh, some closing thoughts here. Um, you know, the possibilities are kind of endless where we're coming from. Um, so this is kind of, um, what, you know, like application wise, you know, getting them to train is really tough, but you know, once you, once you actually able to get some decent output, it's quite amazing what they can do. And they're very interesting. Um, especially if you do some other things like CGANs or InfoGANs that can, you know, you can really do some, some crazy stuff with this. Um, uh, with these types of models. Um, so for this data set, if you want, try doing some higher output sizes, like 128 by 128. Um, also try training on the full data set, which may take a lot longer. So I recommend if you have a DPU at home to get your, a, a local environment set up to use. Otherwise, it'll just take some time on uh, Kaggle. But yeah, I, um, I really hope this was informative um, and you had a lot of fun doing this with me. Um, and uh, and hopefully this online format for our last few workshops will go smoothly and you know they're still in, while still keeping up to our level of quality and um, and you know in our content itself and how we give it um, yeah if you have any questions um, or need any help or anything like that with any of this material you know all of the coordinators and myself are available on discord just give us a ping and we can help you um, you can also set up meeting times for office hours. So it'd be like, hey, can I meet with you at this time? You can. You know, most of us are home now, so it would be a little bit easier to set up these times uh, to meet up to talk about some things if we have any questions. But yeah, thank you for taking the time to watch these videos. And you know, stay safe, and uh, we'll be seeing you uh, in person in the fall, but uh, we'll be releasing our last few videos here over the course of the next few weeks. So. Thank you very much.